So here we are with uh, Greg Lukianov. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Greg. That's good. That's good. Good uh, job. I'm incredibly excited to have you uh, on the show because, uh, as I mentioned uh, while we were off air, uh, for guys like me to be able to do what we do uh, unencumbered by th threats from any nefarious forces, we need guys like you to be protecting us uh, and our ability to speak freely. So thank you so much, Greg, for being here. Uh, I wanted to first sort of get you to speak about, you know, why you became a First Amendment lawyer, then maybe describe, sure. uh, you know, what FIRE does, the organization uh, that you preside over. But first, I wanted to plug your excellent books. Uh, here we go. Let me just read them properly. We've got uh, <laughs> uh, Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship, and the End of, of American Debate and Freedom from Speech. I highly recommend that everybody who's watching the show go out and buy these fantastic reads. I haven't finished them, but certainly from what I've read so far, brilliant stuff. So take it away, Greg. Tell us how you became a constitutional lawyer. You know, it was, I, I attribute it to the fact that I have a Russian father and a British mother, and they both had very different ideas of what you should be allowed to say. My mom really emphasized politeness. My father emphasized brutal honesty. And everybody in my neighborhood, there were a lot of other first generation kids, and they all had different ideas of what you should be allowed to say. So as, you know, first generation Americans, definitely like freedom of speech made sense because of pluralism and multiculturalism. And I, I found it absolutely bizarre that people will invoke pluralism and multiculturalism as ways, uh, as reasons to cut down on speech. Right. If people are actually navigating genuine differences, you know, they need to be able to speak with candor. Um, and then I got more intensely involved with freedom of speech as a student journalist uh, back when I was in college. Um, and then the government tried to pass laws restricting speech on the Internet. That got me really excited about it. So I went to Stanford for law school. I took every class they had in First Amendment law until I ran out. And then I did six extra credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty because this is my passion. I, I interned at the ACLU. And then when they went looking for a, someone to be the first legal director of FIRE, they uh, found me. Right. So maybe you could talk a bit about FIRE. You bet. Yeah, go ahead. Shoot. Well, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education was founded by Harvey Silverglate and Alan Charles Kors. Alan Charles Kors is an amazing intellect. He's a, uh, um, he's a scholar of the Enlightenment who works at Penn. Um, who's a, 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 and Harvey Silverglate is a ACLU attorney, um, civil liberties lawyer um, who uh, has a passion for freedom of speech. And they wrote a book back in 1998 called The Shadow University that's nice. about Thank you. That, 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 that's about the um, uh, what, what, what was then the, the threats to free speech on campus during what could be called sort of like the first sort of real sort of political correctness uh, infection, so to speak. Um, and they got and they kind of thought somewhat naively um, that at least Harvey thought this. Um, that uh, they, they, they'd write the book and this would, you know, the fever would break and people would come back to their senses. Um, but that didn't happen. Uh, instead, they started getting thousands of requests for help. Um, and they realized, wow, we have to found a, a, a nonprofit. So a little over 15 years ago, uh, back in 1999, actually now exactly 16 years ago, they founded um, uh, FIRE. And about a year and a half later, I joined as the first legal director. Oh, and by the way, all, one of the reasons why I'm always happy to plug Unlearning Liberty is that all of the author's proceeds from Unlearning Liberty go directly to the FIRE. Uh, oh, wonderful. Got you. By the way, I should mention that uh, the book that you mentioned, The Shadow University, and another one called the Higher Superstition. Are you, are you aware of this book? I don't know that one. Oh, so Higher Superstition, I mean, it's not quite about freedom of speech, but uh -huh. in, in a sense, it relates to some of the forces that yield some of the realities that we're going to be talking about today. Higher Superstition was written by uh, uh, Gross and Levitt, one of whom is a biologist, the other one is a mathematician, uh -huh. and they basically went after all the gibberish movements and academic uh, settings, uh, postmodernism, uh, uh, blank fill in the studies, right? Feminist studies, women's studies, African centric studies, this studies. So all this identity politics stuff. And, and, and all of this is, of course, organized under the rubric of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. And so when I read these two books, one which is an attack on f freedom of speech, the yes. other one which is an attack on reason. Uh, yeah. I mean, these were just, they, they perfectly meshed together. And I read both of them, I think, exactly around the time that you, you met, maybe about 13, 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. And so they're, they're two of the most important books that I think uh, are out there in the past 15 years. So I recommend for anybody to read them. 
I'm absolutely going to read that. Actually, right now I'm reading Super Forecasters or, okay. or, um, by, uh, uh, by Tetlock, by Philip Tetlock. And what's interesting about it is how much it's infused with this, uh, w w with the, the missing norm of, of freedom of speech that I think people right. sometimes miss, which is epistemic humility, which is a fancy right. way of saying you don't know everything. You actually really honestly, in isolation, we're not even all that bright, even the smartest right. of us. We need to be smart in dialogue and discussion with both right. ourselves and with the past. And so like, the, so the idea of undermining freedom of speech, it's, it's undermining human knowledge itself. Absolutely. You know, so from a personal experience, I mean, you mentioned your, your parents and how, in a sense, their uh, deferring viewpoints led, you know, awakened your interest in this issue. Uh, you know, I also have a personal history that's uh, directly relevant to, to these issues. So, you know, we, I was born in Lebanon. We're Lebanese Jews. We escaped Lebanon under imminent threat of execution. So I grew up in the context of the Middle East where... Uh, certainly the notion of freedom of speech is even in the pl in a place like Lebanon that supposedly is, was progressive and modern is very different from what t the typical person would think as freedom of speech in Canada or the US or Western Europe uh, right. and so uh, I recently told for the first time ever publicly of a story um, a very painful story of mine as we were escaping uh, Lebanon and the actual day that we took off from Beirut to emigrate to Canada as the pilot stated that we had left uh, Lebanese airspace, my mother pulled out a uh, Star of David, put it around my neck and said, now you could uh, freely identify in terms of who you are. I mean, in a sense, it's not exactly wow. freedom of speech, but it's the fact oh, that you had to hide who you I were. I know you were, yeah. Right? Uh, and now if we, if we uh, move to my scientific career, uh, there's also sort of the issue of not necessarily freedom of speech, but forces that try to quell uh, your positions. Uh, I So I developed the field of evolutionary consumption, which is basically the application of evolutionary psychology and consumer behavior. Yep. Most social scientists are profoundly anti-biology in their thinking. And mm -hmm. so I was viewed, uh, much less so today, but originally as a big heretic because yeah. I was introducing vulgar biology to to what shouldn't involve biology, right? Biology is relevant for the mosquito and the zebra, not for consumer consumers. And right. so this idea of how various forces try to stop you from being who you are, speaking what you want, is, is so personally relevant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so. But I think it's a good. I think it's actually a good time to pitch another book that I'm sure you also uh, ad, ad, admire. Um, that's uh, St uh, Stephen Pinker's um, "The Blank Slate." Oh yeah. And, and I honestly think it's the best anti-political correctness book ever written, oh, um, yeah. be because it's Steve uh, Pinker taking on just the idea that we have all of these sort of articles of faith about essentially where what um, that the nature nurture um, uh, argument can only be settled in one 100 percent direction that is actually profoundly anti-scientific. Right. And the great thing about Pinker is he's able to explain it calmly and rationally, right. and but take it to pieces at the same right. time. Right. So maybe you could tell us. I mean, what, one of the things that's wonderful about your 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 long your longer book is that you offer so many you know cases from the trenches. I mean, that's where the, the fun reading is to actually read that stuff, and you're just astonished that this is not just a, a satire from Saturday Night Live. So maybe you could pick. I mean, as many as you want. Uh, sure. Pick a few of the most telling, egregious cases that you've come across, and then maybe then we could. Uh, sort of a bridge to the current case that's making yeah. the headways, the Yale case. Uh, so maybe start with some of the classic cases that you've dealt with. Absolutely. I, I mean, probably our, our most famous case to the extent to which, you know, we have any famous cases is a case um, at Indiana <coughs> University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, where a student um, who was also an employee, this guy was a student janitor, you know, um, not exactly the great oppressor. <laughs> and, and he was reading a book called Notre Dame versus the Klan. It has a picture of a rally on the cover. It had the word Klan on the cover. But guess what? It was about the defeat of the Klan. It celebrated the defeat of the Klan when they marched on Notre Dame because people forget sometimes that the Klan also hated Catholics. Right. You know, they were, they were very broad in their hate. <laughs> Um, and so it's this, this book that celebrates the defeat of the Klan, but because it had this, this picture on the cover and because no one bothered to ask him what it was actually about, he was found guilty of racial harassment without so much as a hearing. Now, and when he went to talk, talk to people on campus, they said, just keep your head down, you know, um, don't fight it. This is just the way things are. Uh, but then he came to the ACLU and he came to fire and we fought this over the course of months. Um, it and it finally took the Wall Street, uh, an article by the, in the Wall Street Journal to get the university to say, well, we're sorry, we, oh, we're totally backing down. Right. 
Uh, and it's just an absolutely, you know, astonishing, uh, astonishing case. And I want to be clear, the fact that it was an anti-Klan book only makes its punishment more ironic. Right. It still would have been uh, protected if he'd been reading Mein Kampf, um, exactly. but it just makes it all that crazier um, that it was actually like even not what they thought it was. Exactly. Uh, now, do you feel that, and I, of course you could give me some other cases, I'd love to hear more cases, oh, yeah, tons. but uh, I, I think I probably know the answer to this, uh, given sort of the political reality on campuses, but what percentage of the violations mm -hmm. uh, will will assort along, you know, political affiliations that we would expect. So do, do you have data on that? Um, you know, we don't have data on that. Uh, we're, we're trying to actually expand fire. We need to expand a lot. I mean, our job has just gotten so huge. I need, like, uh, I need to have twice as many staff as I have right now. And one of the things I want is I want to start getting research fellows because we got to go really deep, uh, deeply into this so we can actually look at the data. I would say that an awful lot of the cases that fire is involved with, are, for, for most of our history, were, were to a degree sort of somewhat apolitical. Oh. You know, they, they, they were, I, I open up um, Unlearning Liberty talking about a student and it has a little bit of a political angle, but he he was a student who was protesting a parking garage uh, uh, for environmentalist reasons. He didn't know that the university president had already been stopped by environmentalists by having uh, from having this parking garage that he somewhat sadly described as part of his legacy um, uh, many years ago by environmentalists. And, you know, since we got to see, look into what actually was going on because we, uh, Bob Corn Revere filed the lawsuit and there was discovery, um, the, the, this uh, university president, you know, embarked on a mission to get this student, you know, punished in some way for, uh, uh, for going against his parking garage. And eventually, what the, when, after the president had dressed down this student for something like an hour and a half, I mean, this president was really, really taking this out of proportion. Um, the student posted a collage on Facebook, um, this protest collage. This is a nice kid, I want to emphasize. Right. Um, and he uh, and what he referred to it is in, 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 as a joke on the fact that the president had referred to this parking garage as his legacy. He called it the President Zachariah Memorial Parking Garage and gave all of the pictures of things that his legacy would look like. And uh, they kicked him out of school because the president was threatened. The, the president claimed right. um, th that he felt this was a threat right. upon his life. Now, there's so many different reasons why. And it's funny, the students today, when I tell the students, when I, when I told this story five years ago on campus, students would be like aghast. Right. When I tell it today, students go, well, of course he felt threatened. Um, and they really want to figure out a way in which the other side, you know, the, the censoring side was right. But I have to explain a couple things. One, the evidence is all clear that the, the president had been trying to kick the student out long before the collage. Two, it probably helps to know that the student in question is a Shambhala Buddhist <laughs> believer in uh, believer in non-aggression and a decorated EMT, so about as nice of a kid as you, you can get. But if you still don't believe that this was uh, that the, the, the president uh, that this wasn't about uh, you know his minor dissent, they the way they kicked the student out was they slipped an expulsion note under his door saying you know help yourself out in the next forty eight hours. Um, and, and it's like no 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 no. If you actually think someone is a threat to the campus, you don't slip a note under his door <laughs> selling. Well, you should you should run along now. Right. Wow. <laughs> so so that so a lot of our cases have had a you know they've been these kind of classic cases of. Uh, don't criticize the administration. Um, meanwhile, though, because of the culture wars, you end up having people not wanting to pay attention to any of this because right. they don't want to even accept that there's a problem with free speech on college campus. Right. But, I mean, it has to be. I mean, so, for example, there's a study that I discussed in uh, some of my uh, – I wrote an article in Psychology Today and another one in Huffington Post where I talked about the lack of intellectual diversity yes. on American campuses. So yeah. there have been studies, as I'm sure you're aware, that have looked yep. at political affiliations of the professors on campuses. And the numbers are, are just staggering. So the, yep. the one study that I'm thinking of, I think it was a 2005 study, they looked at the ratio <clears throat> of Democrats to Republican uh, and – of course, it varied depending on the department that you were in. Across all department, uh, departments, it was five to one. Mm -hmm. But in, in some of the ideological fields, like sociology and uh, you know whatever, uh, humanities and so on, uh, mm -hmm. then it could be as high as 44 to one. Yeah. And so it, it has to be, right? Sure. I mean, a, a naive hypothesis has to be probably correct that uh, the types of cases you're going to see, to the extent that they are multiple, 
politically motivated are mm-hmm. going to be skewed in that direction, right? Well, well, and that's what we're, we're seeing lately is that you have this sort of um, out of control groupthink that's only possible in a situation where you don't have meaningfully dissenting voices. So when John Haidt looked into this, my co-author on a piece that I wrote called The Coddling of the American yes, Mind. beautiful piece. Thank you for, for, for The Atlantic. He did his own studies along also with Philip Tetlock and Jose Duarte and a bunch of other psychologists. Um, and, you know, th- there's a great, uh, 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 you know, uh, example that he gives is that at a social psychology conference, he had, in a room of about a thousand people, he asked how many people here self-describe as conservatives. And three people raised their hands out of a thousand. And he said, rather than, uh, and, and I, I have to assume that there must have been more than, you know, one out of every, two, you know, 270 of, of them actually being conservative. But the fact that they, that those others were afraid to raise their hands speaks volumes all by itself. I mean, it's breathtaking, right? I mean, you know, it's, and this is something that I'm increasingly voicing concerns over. The apathy, if not, and it's, this, of course, is not going to make me friends with a lot of my colleagues, <laughs> just the abject cowardice mm-hmm. to speak out, right? So, and I, I guess that's something that we'll talk about. You know, what are the sure. reasons that might explain some of these realities that we're seeing? Now, one of which I think is simply human cowardice. Uh, so, you know, when this thing happened with the Yale situation, which we'll get into, yep. uh, you may have seen, because I think I tagged you on a few of them, I just went wild two days ago. Uh, on Twitter, right? Uh-huh. Uh, now, of course, the safe position is for me to keep quiet. Who cares about this guy? Yeah. I mean, I know of his work, but who cares about this Nicholas guy? It's mm-hmm. not me, so who gives a damn? And then I started to try to rally some colleagues. Guess yeah. what? I wasn't very successful, and I've uh-huh. got a pretty large platform. So, yeah. so, I mean, how do we get through? So, I mean, I guess we'll talk generally about what are the forces that are that are creating this, but sure. let's, let's focus on this one. I mean, how do we get members of, of academia to mm-hmm. actually care about this issue? Well, you know, the students are helping themselves um, to get more uh, ac- members of academia to care because they're going so overboard. And th- one of the things that, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not politically conservative, um, but I totally understand where political conservatives are coming from th- because they're upset that people are finally noticing this problem of political correctness on campus because in the past year, some a lot of the targets have been liberals, right? And a, a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the critics also, like Jonathan Chait, have also been political liberals. Right. So suddenly it's like massive news that it, right. uh, because you, you, instead of targeting um, you know a conservative professor, they're actually going after uh, you know Laura Kipnis, for example, yes. at, at Northwestern University, which is a horrifying case. By which, the way. by the way, not to toot my own horn, I also yeah. intervene and got. Uh, guys like Joe Rogan to retweet yeah. stuff, right? Because by getting guys that have such large pla- platforms like Joe Rogan to weigh in, it yeah. probably contributes to putting pressure on the nefarious I, folks, right? It absolutely makes a difference. Yeah. It absolutely makes a difference. Now, it is sad that you, you have to ha- have professors understand that, you know, um, this is their careers at stake if they don't stand right. up. If they don't stand up for other professors, next time it could be, you know, their right. career on the line. And I've explained this. I even explained this to a professor at Yale saying, listen, I've never seen a problem like this personally. And I'm like, that's what I always hear when people call fire and say, oh, I never, I every, I thought my students were reasonable. But it only takes one. It only takes one right. administrator who's out of control, one student who has a lack of perspective um, to lead to investigations that could potentially lead your, uh, lead, uh, ruin your career. Right. Now, uh, so let's, maybe maybe this is a good time to talk about the the current sure. Yale case. Maybe you can give us a summary. And I think there's been sort of a, a cascading effect where oh people are now attacking you for yes. using. So talk about this whole thing. It's absolutely yeah, incredible. Yeah, it, 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 take, it takes a little bit of, a, of, of explaining, but I'll try to explain sure. it in as much detail as I can. <clears throat> okay, so I was scheduled to speak at Yale. I was invited by Professor Nicholas Christ- Christakis and his wife, Erica, um, to speak to their students at Silliman uh, House or College. It's basically just a fancy name for the, the dorms at Yale, but they tried to be educational dorms. Right. Um, and I was invited way back in the spring to, to, to speak there about freedom of speech. Um, I was invited before I'd actually published The Coddling of the American Mind, which was right. all about overreactions to speech, about uh, cognitive distortions, you know, right. essentially about the idea that students are catastrophizing, right. that they're engaged in magnification and personalization and have no sense of proportion when it comes to some of these issues. And so I show up on campus and lo and behold, uh, the campus is completely in turmoil over this email that Erica Christakis had sent to her students at Silliman, and it was a very reasonable email. 
um, responding to, and the, here, the, here, part of the context here is that since way, since way back in, in 2010, Halloween has been risky business on college campuses. And, you know, I always give the example of the uh, chief of police at Syracuse University warning students that they would be asked to take off their costumes and judicial char charges filed against them if they were found wearing offensive costumes, which is a bizarre image to begin with. You know, the idea of like, I, I demand you strip right now is just completely <laughs> freaked free, 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 free. But I always kind of thought that uh, the students themselves, and the students, by the way, traditionally in my experience, had been the constituency on campus that had their heads most firmly planted on their shoulders. Right. The administration have always, has always been a problem. Sometimes professors aren't all that helpful, right. but students seem to have an uncommon amount of common sense. But something's changed. So. Erica sends out this, so uh, the, the Intercultural Studies um, uh, Department sends out uh, an email, and you know, it's, it, it's a nicer version of, of warning people about what to, what, right. what to wear, but saying like, you know, be sensitive about what you wear for Halloween, and you shouldn't wear this, and, and ask yourself these questions. And Erica wrote a very thoughtful email saying, listen, you know, I, are, are we really this, do we really lack this much confidence in our students? Is it really my place to tell students what they should wear for Halloween? Isn't part of Halloween, isn't part of the idea of Halloween to be a little bit transgressive? Isn't it, you know, isn't it uh, the idea of it to, you know, play with ideas? And aren't we showing disrespect to student autonomy? And if I could just interject before you go on, yeah. I read that email. Yeah. And I mean, it couldn't be more sort of gently worded so it wasn't sort of bombastic yeah, or exactly. belligerent or bellicose uh, so yeah so go on so I, I, I vouch for the the gentility yeah. of, of the message yes and of course it would still be protected even if it wasn't but it's, it, it just again just makes it more ironic right. so when I showed up you you would have thought something some kind something horrible had happened. I'll explain more about that later. But because you know, I got to see and I got to actually record a confrontation between her husband, Nicholas Christakis, a tenured yes. professor at Yale, um, and dozens of angry students who were shouting at him, who were demanding that he be fired, who were, uh, one of them broke down into tears about it. They were swear and swearing at him. They were the, yeah, oh yeah, right, right to his face. They were saying, how can you sleep? You're disgusting. And I mean, I was only able to capture a little tiny bit of it on video. Um, and, and, oh, and someone, by the way, is saying, it's like, oh, those are edited. I'm like, no, no, I directly uploaded all I had and sent them right out. I think there was one that showed me, like, that I accidentally, like, videotaped just the ground for six seconds. It was the only one we didn't, because, you know, I'm an old man. I right. <laughs> I'm, not the, I'm not the best of the phones. I even hold it in the right position, as you can probably tell from the videos, right. which I've been made fun of for. But yeah, those are the entirety of what I was able right. to get. And, and honestly, in total context, it was much worse right. than it looked in those videos. Um, so I thought this was just completely unhinged. I thought this, this was such a disproportionate response. And having just written an article about you know students um, acting out of proportion, acting in magnification and emotional reasoning, um, you, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe how bad it was. And I've been, I've been on the ground floor for you know, debates over the Muhammad cartoons right. that were much more civil um, right. th th than what I saw. So, and particularly the calls for him to resign. There was an article in the Yale Daily Herald, which they've since taken down, by the way, um, saying saying that, that that both of the Christakis's should uh, should resign. Now, I had to explain to you know I, I need everyone to understand that even though right now um, I, I haven't heard Yale say we're going we're we're investigating whether or not we should terminate the Christakis's, um, you know, either from their positions at Yale or as professors. In my experience. That uh, those discussions are happening behind the scenes, and what and what they're going to want it to look like is that the Christakis's came to this decision on their own. Maybe maybe not this week, but maybe in a couple of months that they just decided, oh, we've decided to move move on from Yale. Um, I've seen this happen. I've been doing this since 2001, and that's why we really need to mobilize people to uh, right. to, to write Yale and be civil, be right, sensible, be reasonable. Um, but to tell them, it's like, listen, if the, the you should make it clear that the Christakis's did something good, they provoked a discussion, and they should stay. They belong at Yale. And I mean, frankly, I mean, not that what I'm about to say next is relevant to the issue. But uh, certainly Nicholas is a astonishingly respected uh, scientist. Again, not that that has any bearing oh. one way or the other, but he's, he's certainly a, an asset to the university. And yeah. uh, although I don't know him personally, I know his, his constant co-author, uh, James Fowler from UCSD. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the way he responded uh, when he was, I mean, to some extent, almost physically threatened, right? I mean, it was physically intimidating to see all these young folks sort of surrounding him in a very ominous manner. 
I mean, I was astonished that you could actually be this calm, this I, restrained, right? I mean, it's, so it's funny because one of the videos that came out that I didn't take that, that's just come out, I think, was trying to sort of portray him as as being as starting to lose his temper. But I have to say that was at the end of him defending himself for hours. And I watched some of the things that wasn't caught on videotape was when he'd be talking to an individual student and they'd be say they, they uh, and the students behind him would say, "Look at us! Don't look! Don't turn your back on us!" Yeah. And then when he did that, the student that he was talking to would, would start saying, uh, look me in the eyes. And it's right. like, I can't actually do both. Right. And I don't want to be yelling. At the, so there was no way he could, he, he he could, could win in this circumstance. Yeah. So, the, so the fact that I think he showed extraordinary patience, right. all, all things considered. And I was frustrated. I was shocked. I was upset. And, and you know, having, having done this for such a long time, um, it takes a lot to shock me. But this was, this was completely disproportionate to what was going on. So the next day when I was at a – I got invited to speak at a panel on, freedom of, on the state of freedom yeah. of speech. Again, coincidentally. Right. Um, and it was for the Buckley program. And I was in a room full of, for the most part, you know, older white conservatives who I honestly think did not believe me. Um, that this this had happened. Now uh, to explain what, but the statement that got that that, that uh, apparently you know got me in trouble, so to speak, um, I should explain that my dad grew up in Yugoslavia. Um, uh, I worked in refugee camps. I always when, when when my friends complain about you know I always expected to have uh, to be wealthy when I was older. Or I always expected to have a lake house when I was older. And these are real things that I have from friends who grew up wealthy. I always say, well, my perspective was always I'm really glad Nazis didn't destroy my village today. <laughs> And, you know, I grew up with horrible, horrific stories, and I developed a dark sense of humor around it right. to, as a coping mechanism sure. for working in refugee camps. Right. So to try to – and, and I, so I'm always amazed at the lack of perspective of students. So I really tried to put a fine point um, on this to a, uh, uh, to a skeptical uh, audience because they, they, they didn't understand. They, like someone was saying – there was someone in the front audience saying, "Are you wait, I don't – you didn't finish the story. What, what happened after the email? I'm like, no, the email was the issue. Right. And I said, given the response to Eric Kerstakis' email, you would have thought that she wiped out an Indian village. And I was really trying to bring it home and right. really, you know, I, I was trying to say this in a simple way, a, a, a dramatic way of saying this is a complete overreaction. Right. People were really – and – I kind of overachieved apparently in my attempt to sort of provoke a reaction because a student suddenly I noticed that a student was yelling at me and putting and, and putting up posters and and I didn't really entirely see what was going on. Then I saw him you know, when they asked him to to, to leave uh, because I couldn't I couldn't keep talking. That he really you know uh, he, he 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 told the. Um, uh, the security guard that he was only he would only be carried out, and then he sort of like lunged at the stage, yelling uh, to me something about how I don't know my history, which was particularly ironic because I'm like, actually, no, I do know my history. That's why I tried to come up with the worst possible thing right. I could think of, the most evocative thing I could think of to make the point that this is the way students are acting, and it's showing a complete and total lack of right. uh, perspective. But it got even worse after that. Apparently, a message went out that someone had made a, 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 a joke about genocide. I'm like, no, I made a joke about lack of perspective. And then apparently dozens of students showed up. I'm not sure how many, but with signs already written saying genocide is not a joke, hashtag. And they started – and apparently, at least according to some of the students, they spit on multiple students um, who were at the Buckley conference. I mean, like this that, – that's assault. Like that, that's obviously not, not, not protected. Um, so I, I was, again, just completely flabbergasted by the entire thing. And so, I mean, so is it, is, are they trying to do anything to you or are you out of their reach? I mean, they can go after the, the, uh, Nicholas and his wife, but are, you know, there's not a lot they can do to me. I, I, th there was a little bit of murmurs, um, and I'd, and I'd be interested to see Yale try this, but saying that I had not gotten permission to videotape on, uh, on Yale's campus. Um, and I'm like, if you really want to go with that argument, you know, I was covering what, looked like it was going to get ugly. And I, and the main reason, really, why I knew I had to videotape it was because I have seen situations like this go down so often. And if they're not on tape right. and students really want to get rid of a professor, they will claim things happened that didn't happen. It's cynical, wow. but it's also true. If okay. you're that determined to get rid of a professor, and, and anything's possible. So, you know, they, they can portray me as a, you know, as a villain as much as they want. I, 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 I can live with that. But I also think it's amazing that they that, – that, a lot of times people don't give anyone the benefit of the doubt or know sure. their family history. It's like, yes, I was trying to think of the single most horrible thing I, I, I could right. think of to, to say this is the way they're reacting. But, um, but the, the, the case seems – the interesting thing is 
the students seem to have shifted their attention, um, at least in the past couple of days. There, there's been like a day of outrage yesterday at Yale. But in this case, they were focusing on allegations that a fraternity had um, turned away, or at least a fraternity member had turned away uh, black women from getting into the, fr getting into the party. Perfectly legitimate thing to protest. Sure. Um, and if they're focusing on something like that, and they're not focusing on the Christakis's, I think that's, you know, for lack of a better term, progress. But, but I really just have to stress again, uh, you know, people have to, have to get active. They have to write Yale, particularly yeah. if they're Yale, Yale alumni, and they have to say the Christakis's need to stay. These are the kind of people we need. And we also really have to think about how, what, what, what cognitive behaviors we're teaching students. Because if, if there is this um, immediate desire to anytime you hear anything that makes you uncomfortable to shut it down, to spit on people, to shout in their face, to make sure they never say it again. That is exactly the opposite of what a university should be teaching. Well, and th think of it this way. Let's suppose that uh, folks do write in, put pressure on Yale. Uh, nothing happens to uh, the Christakis as, as of course should be the case. Right. But now what is, what do you think is the prediction in terms yeah. of whether Nicholas will or his wife will dare open their mouth again right yeah. they'd have to have a lot of testicular fortitude to be <laughs> able to to say you know what i'm going to keep speaking my mind so even if they quote win by staying yeah. at yale they've lost because they're they're going to be afraid to say hello in the wrong tone to the wrong person because maybe that hello will be a form of assault right yeah uh, and so look i'll, I'll give you a, a personal anecdote and then and then i'm going to offer you a theory as to why I think some of the students are doing this. One of uh -huh. several possible forces, and I want to get your response to it. Uh -huh. But uh, So, you know, I, I'm somebody who's very much anti-political correctness, mm -hmm. as you might imagine, uh, if you follow me. Uh, and I know that I tackle people who are much, much, much scarier than the folks at Yale. Uh, people who will do bodily harm to you. Uh, and so my wife, uh, and I've mentioned this on, in other public venues, my wife on a few occasions has sort of come behind me as I open my laptop and she sees me sort of writing something passionately or I'm upset about something and she looks nervously at what I'm writing and she'll sort of whisper something to the effect of, uh, you know, we've got two young children, right? So basically her reflex is to say, uh, and of course it's a very pragmatic and real instinct that, you know, please be careful what you write because some of the folks that you criticize are not Yale undergraduate students. Right. Now, the fact that she even, even if she is overblowing the threat, which she's yep. not, but even if she were, the fact that in the 21st century in Canada, the wife of a professor could walk up and say, please keep yep. your big mouth shut. We've got young children. That's the canary singing in the coal mine, and he is singing loudly, right? Absolutely. Uh, so have you met Fleming? Have you uh, met or interviewed Fleming Rose? I haven't. Uh, you, if you can get him on the program, we really should. Because Fleming, Fleming Rose. Fleming Rose is the guy. It was the publisher at the um, of uh, Gillen Poston, which I'm oh, sure I'm going to oh, say yeah, wrong. Sure, sure. Yes, yes, when yes, they yes. published the Muhammad cartoons, yes. and you know, like he's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure on campuses considered to be some kind of monster. <laughs> but what's amazing is if you meet the guy, he is a polite, secular, kind Dane who just thought that this, you know, we wanted to make a point. That oh yes, I know who it is. I, now that you said the Dane guy, yes, I know who it is. Yes. Yeah, and, and the, he wrote a great book called Tyranny of Silence that, that I also recommend to everybody, yes. absolutely everybody. But, you know, the fact that he has to spend the rest of his life surrounded by bodyguards exactly. is a terrifying statement on, on, on the state of free speech. The fact that, and that's one of the reasons why the lack of perspective on campus upsets me so much, because you're you're going you know crazy over an email that someone sent that was that was and you know absolutely in my opinion perfectly reasonable. Um, real bad things are happening in the U.S., but yes. also really bad things are happening. Let's you know like the the fact that um, uh, you, you know Gary Trudeau thought it was a good idea to blast Charlie Hebdo for its insensitive cartoons as quote unquote punching down. At the same time, uh, atheist bloggers or even just skeptic bloggers are being are being hacked to death in the streets of Bangladesh. Right. This is a complete like, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes I send out things about the global picture. Yes. You know, to be kind of like, guys, if you want to be protesting something right now, you know, where we might actually be able to make some progress, pro protest Erdogan in right. Turkey. 
Exactly. Oh, by the way, you, you, your wife talks about how, how uh, you, you, you talk about how your wife tells you not to say certain things. My wife is like, I love Istanbul, Greg. Let us please let us go back to Turkey. Please stop saying things. <laughs> so about her her, concern, her concerns are tourist tourist are related. Tourist, tourist related, yeah. <laughs> All right, gotcha. Um, but at the same time, it's like, sorry, like the, 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 he, he's uh, he's out of control. Right. Um, and and there are really serious things. I mean, I think that partially campus political correctness, since it's dulled our interest in freedom of speech, since it's dulled our sort sort of uh, really once very pure belief in freedom of speech. It makes us less concerned about horrible treatment of, for example, journalists all right. over the world right. or quote unquote blasphemers. Right. So let me let me mention a few. So let, let's expand to global uh, to the global level and then yep. we'll come back uh, to the American context. So uh, you mentioned the Muhammad uh, cartoon. So I, I, I'm not sure if you are you familiar with Ezra Levant. Do you know who that is? Um, I know the name, but uh, tell me more. So Ezra Levant is is also a lawyer, just like yourself, and mm -hmm. a pundit, a political pundit uh, and sort of media personality, who uh, had a magazine back in uh, around the mid two thousands, uh, and he decided to uh, print the cartoons uh, that were causing uh, the furor around the world mm -hmm. when all of the other uh, Western media uh, refused to do so. So yep. he was summoned to a hate speech tribunal in Canada. See, unlike the U.S., and of course, I think you'll be able to, uh, you know, comment on this better than I can since you're the lawyer, not me. Uh, you know, in Canada and in much of the Western world, we have these uh, these hate speech tribunals that are springing up everywhere where basically uh, if you say anything that that could be anything that could bother anybody that yeah. could offend anybody. It could be packaged as, as hate speech, yeah. and you should, if you haven't seen it, you should go and watch his interaction with the hate speech person who is who has summoned him to this tribunal. Mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, I mean, how how incredulous he is uh, about the fact that he actually has to explain as a journalist uh, why it is okay for him to publish cartoons of some historical uh, yeah. character. So that, that's one case. Uh, a more, even more perhaps, con quote, contentious case, which you may be familiar with, is Geert Wilders. Do you know who that yeah. is? So, I, I, vaguely. He's a politician, a Danish politician? Uh, uh, Dutch politician. Dutch, sorry. So sorry. Geert Wilders is somebody who doesn't pull punches when it comes to some of the uh, dangers that are happening in, in Europe in terms of mm -hmm. the increased Islamization of, of all sorts of countries. Mm -hmm. And in his case, since he is one of the leading politicians of, uh, of the Netherlands, uh, he speaks using his political forum, right? Mm -hmm. And if you disagree with him, then speak, you know, use whatever forum you have to argue against him. Well, the Dutch court system took him to court under hate speech, at, mm -hmm. at which point his response was, even though it shouldn't matter whether what I'm saying is right or wrong in terms mm -hmm. of me, I mean, you could, you, could, you could say things that are wrong and that's protected, right? Uh, Holocaust deniers are protected in terms of their being able to speak and we all know in, that they in are- In the US, and in, in a lot of countries they're not. True. Uh, so anyways, in his case, he said, well, can you challenge anything, the veracity of anything that I said? And now here's one of the most chilling things that I think I've ever heard. So the Dutch magistrate said, it doesn't matter whether what you said is right, is correct, is veridical. The fact that you would say that and it could cause hurt offense and trigger hatred towards a group, that's why we have to stop it. So speaking the truth, if it hurts someone, yeah. ha so I mean, so in, in a sense, to the extent that I think the US has the First Amendment protection, there's an extra layer of protection that the rest of us in the so-called free world don't have. Yeah. Would, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, I should tell you about uh, the the next books that I'm planning to write. Oh, right. Um, and the uh, uh, and originally the next book I was planning to write was, you're, you're familiar with Peter Singer's um, Expanding Circle Theory, right? Uh, you mean Peter Singer, whom I hung out with a few days ago in Mexico? Oh, no, I'm not familiar with him. Please tell me about him. <laughs> Very nice. So, and I think he's, I think he's right on, on, okay. on the Expanding Circle. I think, and I know that you care about, um, you know, animal welfare. Yes. Apple, you know, like it's very closely related to um, uh, Peter Singer's idea. Uh, but I was going to write something that sort of takes, that riffs on that um, and kind of counters to a degree libertarian optimism right. by talking about the shrinking circle. Right. Um, that and, because, and it's not compared to some idealized golden age in the past where everybody could speak free, freely because there was never such a golden age. 
Um, but you would think as of 1989 or 1991 with the defeat of totalitarianism finally um, that that liberal uh, liberalism, that sort of free speech liberalism had, had won out, um, right. which makes it all the more shocking that we're in a situation that of course the unfree world is unfree. Right. The Islamic world is less free than it was even in the 1970s or 60s right. since the fundamentalist revolutions. But even the countries that we absolutely thought of as being completely free, you know, in Europe or Australia or Canada, they're less free, um, they're, uh, and it's not just the hate speech laws. It's not just the blasphemy laws. It's the national security laws. I mean, the the, the, the privacy laws they had in Toronto, for example, right. for bizarrely extended to the, the your crack smoking mayor, right, right. Um, and it was one of the reasons why people f didn't, didn't find out that he had such right. a drug problem for such a long time, right. which, which to Americans just absolutely doesn't make sense. But even in the United States, the the circle's getting smaller and smaller. Right. Um, and uh, but I've decided that the next book that I, I think I'm uh, that I'm actually now planning right now that that would be that's a huge research project that I'm still working on. But given how fundamentally I feel like people don't understand how profound a theory, how profound an innovation freedom of speech is. Yes. Uh, the, the title I'm playing with right now is a much shorter book called simply Freedom of Speech. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> but and, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. And just sure. explaining some of the most basic concepts, uh, epistemic humility, like we mentioned yes. before, open-mindedness, uh, but also things like the Streisand effect. Um, right. the, the Streisand effect being that if you try to censor something, you tend to actually amplify it. Right. And by the way, when it comes to the Muhammad cartoons, one of the reasons why we practically guaranteed future violence by not showing the Muhammad cartoons as part of any news story related to it was we short-circuited the Streisand effect. Right. We, we, we had this effect where essentially, like, no, th there's a reason why no Nobody ever says to you, it's like, you know, if you're confronting a bully, the best thing you can do is give that bully everything he wants. Right. And nobody, nobody says that for a reason. But in this case, what we did was we said, okay, well, you know, if you're willing to murder people, then fine, we'll do what you want. And that's a terrible precedent. Which, by the way, so a couple of points, and I want to come back sure. to this in a second. So yeah, yeah, yeah. what was your reaction when uh, President Obama went up to the United Nations and said, I mean, I might, I'm paraphrasing maybe slightly his quote, but that the future... Uh, does not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. I mean, to me, that was astonishing that a yeah. sitting president could say that. Do you agree? I I actually, I, I'd hate to comment on it because I don't know the context of the full remarks. Okay. But I will say something that Obama did say that was, right. that, that was good recently, is he actually did say, after the Atlantic article came out, that students shouldn't be coddled. And that yes, he did say that. Confrontation. Yeah, true. So the, that, that's one I do know the full context for. And right. in that case, I was like, all right, I hope you mean it. Meanwhile, if you really mean it, you better rein in the Department of Education, which is one of the reasons why. Because some of this is ideological, Gad, right. but some of it is also just lawyers at campuses saying, listen, it's impossible to please the Department of Education. It seems like there's nothing we can do that isn't considered harassment. So over enforce, right? Over enforce whether it comes to sexual assault or even over enforce when it comes to uh, and to comments that might be even conceived of as harassment. Right. Which, by the way, is virtually anything these days. Right. So one of the things that's really driving this uh, situation on campus into overdrive is the overzealous Department of Education. And if Obama is serious about what, it, what he said about coddling students, he needs to rein in the Department of Education. Right, got it. Now, you mentioned how innovative mm -hmm. uh, the notion of freedom of speech is. And I, I, I guess I would, I'll take it in the context of sort of the totality of our recorded history. Yes. It is a incredibly rare occurrence exactly. that, that we live in. So let's link it since, you know, I study evolutionary psychology uh -huh. and, 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 you know, innate human nature. You know, E.O. Wilson, uh, the Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist who studies social ants, uh, and, and, and that species is relevant in a second because I'm going to quote him. He said mm. something to the effect, uh, you know, socialism slash communism, great system, wrong species. And, <laughs> and, and what he meant by that, that right, what he meant, of course, is that in the context of social ants where you have a queen and then everybody else is equal, they're just mm. worker ants that sort of support her reproductive duties, uh, then socialism or communism in its purest sense is right because you don't have hierarchies. You have a queen and everybody else is the same. To the extent that you try to impose that economic, social, and political system on humans, and if we understand that human nature uh, does create dominance hierarchies, uh, then we could have predicted that communism is going to fail. Yeah. So taking this idea to freedom of speech 
would we then say that the default value of humans is to actually not grant freedom of speech, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's if I am boss, mm-hmm. an inherent trait of my being your boss is that I will stop you from speaking. Would you agree with that? Um, not totally sure. The, 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 you're saying that it's human nature to censor. I'm asking. I'm not sure. What, I, what I'm saying is that to the extent that we have this endless capacity to create dominance hierarchies. Right. Maybe it isn't, and, and I mean, I, I say maybe, but I, it seems based on the historical record that since freedom of speech has existed in so few cases, yes. that the default value probably is not for people to have freedom of speech. I, 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 got, I got it now. And actually, this is really cool because um, I refer to this, I have a term for this. I call okay. it censorship gravity. Okay. Um, that essentially, the, that, that throughout all of history, there's something in human nature that draws us back to the comfort of conformity, to the comfort of people not challenging our points of view, and draws us away from that, that wonderfully troublesome uh, cognitive habit of doubt. Right. Um, certainty is much more comfortable, even if we're dead wrong. Right. And that's one of the amazing and, unpra- and impractical things about the scientific revolution, you know, uh, 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 about the scientific method, is that it's about the systematization of doubt. To a degree, exactly. doubt sets you free. I mean, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm an atheist, but I, but right. I think Zen Buddhism is fascinating because right. it's so much based on the uh, shocking, uh, shockingness of the now. But that's a discipline. And right. it's a discipline because I do, I think uh, you're right, it does go against our natural tendency to want people to agree with us, to want conformity, right. to want um, people to shut up when they're saying difficult things, but it's not intellectually healthy for us. So right. in a sense, we are fighting, you know, now that I understand what you're saying, we are fighting the censorship gravity all the time, and it's up to people all over the world to make sure that that, 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 that gravitational force does not win. Right. Now, do you think uh, the experience or the experiment of having freedom of speech could be sufficiently long lasting that that becomes sort of the default value i don't mean it becomes a default value in the sense that it gets coded in your genes but i right. mean it becomes sort of well of course it's natural for people to or do you think it will always be sort of the 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 minority position fighting against a, a, a tsunami of totalitarianism the only the only thing that gives me faith in uh, and, I, and it's a very small only uh, sorry it's a very big only thing that gives me faith in the future success of freedom of speech and right now I'm probably about as pessimistic as I've ever right. been. The reason why I believe in for speech and doubt and systemized questioning and all of these things is because it works really well. Right. And I think that we're going to keep on coming back to the fact, and that's one of the reasons why Super Forecasting is an interesting book, why so many of the books that I read um, is that we're acting as if the evidence, uh, if you look at Europe right now, you would think that study after study was indicating that uh, forced conformity and silencing and not really saying what you mean and not engaging in candor and not dissenting has been proven to be better for us. But nothing could be further from the truth. The evidence gets stronger and stronger that open mind, doubt, dissent, actually challenging your own confirmation bias, that, those are the effective ways. And those are all part and parcel of the intellectual liberal science idea that right. Jonathan Rausch talks about in Kindly Inquisitors. Exactly. So the evidence is getting stronger for freedom of speech, not weaker, but we're acting as if the evidence is getting, is, is getting weaker. Well, and there are a million various uh, sort of metrics that mm-hmm. measure the health, the wealth, the happiness of a society as a function of many of the things that we're talking about. And again, here, the empirical evidence is astonishingly clear, right? Freedom yields healthy, happy societies. Uh, And there is no other path by which you can generate as much well-being for as many people. And meanwhile, the, 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 something that, that, that I find so disturbing about the students at Yale and students across the country is nobody's taught them um, about the sort of speech action distinction. Right. Um, and I have to make the point. It's like, you know how we solved um, all problems, almost all problems, <laughs> before we said, it's like, listen, I'll hear people out. Um, before that became at least a, a kind of a value, it was by arresting them or executing them right. or making or, or, or if you want to be really nice making them go to the other village or making them promise to shut up or for example crucifying them making them take hemlock <laughs> putting them in the Colosseum, for example right. like you know just to put some examples out of the top of my head right well um, I, you know I, I've noticed that by the way in in my engagement with just I mean random people uh-huh so uh, they'll love a million positions that I take 
Mm-hmm. But then there is some issue that arises yep. where we disagree. And it right. could be as banal as I support Arsenal. This is a soccer team in, in England. And they support Chelsea. I, so they love my position on freedom of speech, on anti-political correctness. They love my scientific work. Right. They think I'm the greatest thing that's ever lived. But they now find out I support <laughs> Arsenal. I become the biggest, <laughs> most disgusting, irrational pig that the world has. I mean, but I mean, I'm, I'm, it sounds like I'm using colorful words, but yeah. some of the exchanges get heated to, to sure. that level. And so you see that people have an inability Yep. to disagree in an agreeable manner. Yep. And, and that's really problematic. They view a disagreement as an assault. I mean, yep. how dare you? I mean, I really thought you were a smart, reasonable person. Right. Then you go I'm tell arsenal. me... Th- that you're like, arsenal? I mean, what kind <laughs> of pig must you be? I mean, I mean, I thought you were a man of science, for God's sakes. Right? So, but, but I mean, it happens. So, I'll just give you another example. Mm-hmm. Trophy hunting, right? Huh? So I took the position that I'm against trophy hunting. Of course, yeah. And now tons of people who had become my fans through, for example, Joe Rogan show, yeah. uh, who are avid hunters or supportive of avid hunters. I mean, some of the most nasty sort of hate-filled stuff that I received were from these guys, right? And that kind of compelled me to then put out a sad truth clip on my YouTube channel where I shared the analysis, the scientific analysis of trophy hunting Mm -hmm. but again they couldn't disagree with me or at least engage me i had suddenly become a complete wuss a tree hugger a pussy if i could use that word a green guy uh and so it's just incredible the inability that and i think that's exactly what we're creating with these university students as i think you mentioned in one of your talks that i recently watched you're not giving them the the weaponry to actually navigate disagreements correct right yeah absolutely and and, and it's kind of funny because when, when you read certain in, in intellectuals writing um and and they'll write these things you know of course ra- you know for presumably a rational audience but basically against rationality because like look at all these horrors that, that rational empiricism has brought us <laughs> And of course, you know, I agree with also again with Steve Pinker in his book. It's like no, those were mostly those were those were overwhelmingly anti-rationalist movements. But the idea that we've ever been particularly good at practicing rationality right. and practicing empiricism is nonsense. We're terrible at it. it. It's not. It doesn't come naturally to us. That's why someone had to essentially invent it over right. a slow a slow period of time. But we have to. Keep but all of these disciplines that we can um, use to see the world a little bit more clearly and a little bit more uh, in a little less biased way, they all require freedom of speech. Um, because, for example, if you don't know what people really think, you don't understand the world. So when, when people talk about, well, you should just ban people who say really offensive thing, it's like, so there's no informational value in knowing what people really think? That's crazy. Exactly. You know, I, I faced a situation a few years ago that I personally got involved in, again, sort of coming in as the guy on the white horse, the knight, uh, Satoshi Kanazawa. Does that name ring a bell? Do you know who that is? No, who's that? Satoshi Kanazawa is an evolutionary psychologist who okay. who had a very sort of bombastic style of writing. He, he had a Psychology Today blog where uh-huh. he had become very, very popular because he wrote in a style that was in your face and you mm-hmm. know people took to it. And he yeah. kept sort of pushing the envelope. And at one uh-huh. point, this was around 2010, maybe I can't remember exactly what it was. He wrote an article where he was summarizing some research. This wasn't his own research. He mm-hmm. was summarizing somebody else's research regarding perceived attractiveness of men and women and specifically uh, depending on the race that they were, whether they uh-huh. were black women, black men, and so on. And Part of the findings that he that that these other researchers had found apparently was was that uh, well it was a politically incorrect conclusion, mm-hmm. and so he reported this. But his title was a bit obnoxious and so on. So yeah. there was a huge uh, uh, outcry. Right. Let's get him fired from his job at the London School of Economics. He's a racist. He's a eugenicist. Uh, look at evolutionary psychologists; they're all Nazis and so on. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote an article. Uh, saying that the 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 idea of purging a blogger uh, with, with with whom we might disagree sets a very dangerous precedent. My argument was, if the stuff that he wrote in there is idiotic, for example, let's say he misrepresented the science, he came mm-hmm. to conclusions that were not uh, supported by the science, then let his idiocy 
serve as the punishment, right? right? I mean, there is no greater punishment that you could give a guy than to keep his words up there if he's an idiot. But right. to purge him sets yeah. a very dangerous precedent because tomorrow it will be me and the next day it will be you. Yep. Now, here's, what, here's the incredible thing. People wrote to me privately, fellow academics saying, oh my God, you've got such big balls. Thank you so much for writing it. I've been thinking the same thing, but I'm too afraid to say it. Yeah. What are you afraid of, right? I mean, I, I mean, there are Bangladeshi bloggers who are speaking their minds despite the dangers of being hacked to death. Right. But somebody is sitting at MIT in his fancy tenured position and is afraid of his or her shadow. But yeah. yet they are sufficiently comfortable to write to me privately to say, hey, thank you, God. Thank you for those big testicles. So, I mean, how do we get around that? I mean, how do we infuse courage back into people, uh, Greg. It's, it's been one of the most frustrating things I've had to deal with is that uh, professors, I've, see, I've, well, I've seen this very same phenomenon. Uh, what, what FIRE wants to do, um, and, and as far as another way that I want to expand, is I want someone who, uh, on staff whose full-time job is to reach out to the brave professors and to support them. Um, so because I'm, are, so I'm the, guessing I'm getting an, a call soon? Absolutely, you're in. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're still we're still U.S. based. Uh, uh, right, right. Uh, so I, there's one there's one dude on Twitter who's always kind of like, "What's your position on international free speech?" My position on international free speech is we're a U.S. based organization, depending on the First Amendment. But also, I don't have many billion dollars to, for example, <laughs> you know, like if, if I could liberate China or North Korea, sure. But I, you know, I, I'd, li I'd I'd settle for making universities more free for speech. Right. Um, but definitely finding the finding the good ones and letting them know that they have support, letting them them know that they uh, uh, because because at the one time you can you can criticize them for being co uh, uh, cowards and sometimes they are, but then when you look at things like what ha what is going on at Yale, you know, like the idea that, th that and that wasn't even her pushing the envelope. That wasn't someone saying something really uh, r really controversial in, in the grand scheme of things. And when you see that, you know, you can understand why some professors are like, whoa, you know. Right. Um, I, you know, like with Laura Kipnis or with Alice Dreger, you know, Alice Dreger, you know, quit her job at Northwestern because she felt like she just couldn't deal. And that was just this year because she couldn't deal with the fact that the university was always citing branding over, uh, uh, over the content right. of her. Uh, and she, and this is an author of a, of a really good book called Galileo's Middle Finger yes. about academic freedom. Yes. Hey, yes, but it's incredible. a it's a big fight, Gad. So I really appreciate your your help in this. And all we can do is keep on spreading awareness. And one thing that we gotta we gotta make sure is people understand the basic principles of this stuff. They gotta understand it's about humility. It's about open mindedness. It's yes. about human innovation. It's about progress. And if you decide that to um, uh, push in the direction of dreary conformity, um, then those universities that do that should be ones that people don't attend. Um, right. if, you, if you really want the skills that are going to give you a happier, smarter, more innovative life, then you might in some cases be better off you know, having a stack of books this high and wandering off into the woods by yourself that, than having someone say, listen, you're only allowed to think the following five things. I mean, that's almost a perfect place to end the show. Uh, <laughs> but I want... so. I want to ask you one more question, and then I guess maybe if another time I'll give you my theory about why students are doing this. Unless you want yeah. me to go on, how, depends how much time you have. You, oh, you, I did, everything's so crazy. I do probably. Yeah. Have. Okay. So, uh, so do you think that there will be forces? So maybe, maybe here I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll give an optimistic answer, not notwithstanding the fact that you are at right. your most pessimistic moment, as you mentioned earlier. So, do you think that there is now a, a start of an awakening uh, that might? redress the trend or do you think we are going to go into an infinite abyss of darkness well we're definitely not going to go into an infinite abyss of darkness um but uh what's amazing about it is the pushback against this sort of new what what what, what height and i called it's beyond political correctness right it's vindictive protectiveness right. it's this vicious kind of like don't you dare dissent kind of attitude right. um now what's Amazing about it is I think there's been a major pushback this entire year, once again, not just coming from conservatives, coming from uh, coming from political liberals saying, you know, pe people in the nation writing enough is enough. People in, in magazines that have always been, you know, uh, behind a lot of the causes of people uh, 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 of, you know, what might be considered politically correct causes are even saying, whoa, OK, hold on. But the thing that does depress me is even though that's been a major theme of this entire year, 
you have universities proceeding, you know, as if none of this is happening, right. passing microaggression policies that include um, referring to, you know, that you shouldn't refer to people, you shouldn't say things like uh, the most qualified person should get the job. Like they're, they're, they're completely, uh, completely blind to it. So I do think that there's, uh, there's an awakening about it. I do think there's an awareness, but my goodness, there's so much work to be done. Right. Uh, last thing. Uh, wanted to plug two of your very exciting uh, projects, one dealing with comedy, the other one, oh, the, new, the new debate that you've started. Could you talk about these two things and then we'll wrap it up? Sure. Um, the most important thing is I'm executive producer of a film called Can We Take a Joke, um, which I started working on. I, my idea for it was way back when I did a, um, a, a podcast at the Comedy Cellar. And uh, Lee Camp, who was the most liberal um, uh, comedian on the panel, said, I don't like playing campuses anymore because I can't use my good material. And I was like, well, that only makes sense to me, but I hadn't heard it from the mouth of an actual comedian. And so we started working on this. We got funding for it last year. Ted Ballacard's the director of right. it. Um, and it, lo and behold, you know, we're halfway done with it, and Chris Rock comes out and says, um, right. I don't want to play campuses anymore. Jerry Seinfeld comes out and says it. Of course, Bill Maher says it because he's had a terrible year for that. And just a comedian after comedian is saying, come on, enough is enough. And so this is premiering um, in New York City. Um, at Doc NYC this Friday. Nice. Yeah. Um, th this Friday. So definitely, if it, you know, uh, it, 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 unfortunately, it's sold out. Um, but definitely, if people want to see it, we we'd love to get it at more documentary festivals right. and, and that kind of stuff. So it's, the timing for that couldn't be better. Um, it's got Gilbert Gottfried in it. It's nice. got Penn Jeanette uh, in it. It's got Jim Norton in it. It's got Lisa Lampanelli in it. It's got Heather McDonald, Kareth Foster, Chris Lee. It's it. it I, I, the thing that I'm so pleased about it is that it's thoughtful, but it also manages to be really entertaining. And it makes the point that the much revered comedian Lenny Bruce would not survive a minute on the modern yeah. campus. Right, right. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is we're trying to do more debates on campus. Um, and we've been, and we're trying to sort of like, you know, slowly ease our way into getting students used to the idea that people who disagree with you are not necessarily, and this is amazing, you have to teach students this, right. but are not necessarily stupid or evil. Um, so we've had two so far, and they're both, and I, and they're actually really, you know, fun topics, but, you know, sort of just uh, like, like training wheel type uh, right. uh, uh, type debates where the first one was at Texas A&M, a very serious football school, was whether or not college athletes should be paid. Oh, right. And that was tremendously fun because we actually got someone from ESPN and um, from the NCAA, which we were like, um, I couldn't believe we got someone from the NCAA. The last one we did, which was fascinating for me, um, much much more sort of intellectual, but what, whether or not students should be allowed to take smart drugs. Um, oh. is, is it And it was fascinating because I, I, I came in not knowing a lot about the science behind it. And the side that, that, um, uh, that said yes um, came in so much better prepared and basically saying, Yes, um, they should. And they won by a, a landslide like I haven't seen, which I really was not expecting. Right. Um, so what we're trying to do is model good behavior when it comes to debate. Because right. yes, I'm a First Amendment person. Yes, I'm a free speech person. But that doesn't mean I think there's equally good ways to debate. And I think right now our society is not debating very well. Right. right. Um, and if we could actually could it, just imagine a world for a minute, Gad, where we spent a tiny fraction of the amount of energy, of cognitive IQ power that we spend on being outraged on fixing <laughs> the world's problems, like we'd be, uh, we'd, everything we'd, be we'd, fixed. we'd colonize Jupiter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. We'd be all over the solar system. Incredible. Hey, Greg, I mean, we could go on for hours, but oh, I yeah. know you're very busy. Uh, this has been an utter pleasure, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have a chance to chat again. Thank you so much. I know you're unbelievably busy, so that you took an hour of your time to chat. That was very, very kind of you. Uh, thank you, and good luck fighting the good fight. Thank you, Gad. Take care. Pleasure talking to you. Cheers.